All right, well, good morning. I haven't been here for uh, a week. I was down in Mexico enjoying uh, Los, Los Cabos. Uh, I think that'll be my last trip to Mexico. It's just, it's just Mexico, you know. Even though you're in a really nice resort area, it's just, it's incredibly dirty. It really is a dirty place. It's just not uh, nearly as, it, it makes you appreciate America so much more. You kind of get back and you're like, wow, everything's so clean, you know. You think that downtown sometimes is dirty. You're like, wow, there's a lot of dirt. No, that place down there too is kind of like a desert and it also has a lot of uh, issues with flooding and they had a pretty much a tropical storm. We landed and we saw the bad rain and then by the time we landed it was just pouring rain. So the first two days it was 40 mile an hour winds, tropical storm. So that was always fun. But we had a good time on the vacation. It's always fun to go and be away. It's kind of nice to be out of the country because I couldn't really answer my phone too much even though I had 800 minutes of international but you know. It is, it is what it is. Uh, we had a good time while we were down there. We did do some fishing. We met with a guy while we were down there. <clears throat> and I, I went down to the one fishing place. They weren't, the f first guy that I originally had booked, he wasn't going to be able to do it because they were, just because of the hurricane, so I had to pick different days. And so I ended up walking to another place. They were closed. I went into another shop, and the shop was there. And the guy, uh, I told him exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to catch. And he says, oh, you need to talk to uh, this guy named Wesley. So I said, okay, okay, no, I'll go talk to this guy, Wesley. So uh, he said, let me, let me call him up and see what we can do. So I, I went home. I went kind of home, went to the hotel, Googled his name, looked him up, kind of saw what he did. And I said, yeah, this looks like it be, should be a lot of fun. So I went on his website, and he said something about his creator, right? So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Uh, that'll be a good door opener. You know, I'm always looking for one of those. So he ends up saying, uh, yeah, he's available, and we're going to meet, meet him the next morning. So I meet him the next morning, and we get in the car. And I said, I saw your uh, website. It looks like you've been here since you've been like seven. He goes, yeah, yeah, we came down here with my family. And I said, why'd you come down here? And he goes, oh, I came down because of, uh, uh, you know, my parents had some things that they were doing down here. And I'm like, all right, this is the typical missionary dodge question. You know what I mean? That's how it typically goes. I've been around enough missionary kids to where you know where they're dodging it. And I said, I said what were they doing down here? And Jamie kind of is like in the back. I guess see her kind of smiling. I said, what were they doing down here? Oh, they were, uh, you know, starting a ministry. I said, like a church? Said, yeah, they're starting a church. I said, what kind of church was it? Oh, a non-denominational church? Well, what, what religion? Oh, Christian. You know, I kind of got them into it. I said, oh, that's interesting. So we had a discussion. And for about 45 minutes of our, you know, couple hour, five, six hour trip, you know, we, we probably sat there and talked some doctrine and theology. It was very good. Um, he, he really was interested, and he, he said a few things to me. He says, you know, I've never heard somebody talk about some of the things that you've talked about. He says, I feel like I'm the only person that understands some of these things. So he was talking about Israel. He understood some things about that, and he's like, I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that said that. So what was funny is he hit me up on Facebook within you know, a day or two, and he's already sending me stuff on Facebook, like, yo, man, this is what I was talking about. Can you read this? Let me know what you think. And I'm like, okay, I'm in Mexico, and I still have some type of, you know, ministry to do some things there. And that was really, it was really a fun time. Really, it was encouraging to go out with him and, and, uh, and, and chit-chat and talk. But, you know, you kind of, I, I looked, and I told him, I said, I saw your, your mention of creator on your Facebook, and that's kind of, or on your website, and that's why I, I mentioned it to you. And he goes, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, some people get really weird about it because they ask me why I'm down here, and then I tell them, and then they just, the rest of the trip, it's like I get the silent treatment. So I'm like, yeah, I could see that also being the case. So is he going to proselytize and, you know, whatever else. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to bring up, I, I mentioned this in, in Bible study uh, last week, last week <clears throat> or this, actually this past Wednesday, and I didn't, I didn't, I printed this out because I wanted to show it to you. I, I, I'm on a lot of blogs, and I know you guys know that. I like to post on them. I like to read them. just kind of gives me the worldwide, you know, viewing of what's going on in Christianity. And this is pretty interesting. It says, uh, uh, in, in light of the changing doctrinal positions of many Christians, we wish to uh, reconfirm your particular position as one of the missions we support. And so what they do is they have, you know, pastors that come in, or they have teachers or missionaries that come into their church, and they say, well, yeah, well, we want you to come in, we want you to teach or preach or, or whatever you're doing. We want to support you, but we want to make sure that you're doctrinally sound, right? We want to make sure that whatever you're teaching or preaching, that we, we stand behind it, that it is, you know, doctrinally correct. And they go through here, and the, this was getting a lot of guff. I mean, people were saying, this is ridiculous. How dare they ask such questions? And I thought to myself, I'm like, no, I, I think that this is actually very good. 
And, and Russ has always said, you know, we guard the pulpit and make sure that, you know, we don't just let anybody off the street. Hey, I'm a Christian. Come on in. Yeah, let's preach. And then all of a sudden he starts telling you all kinds of crazy things, and you guys are all going, well, what's going on, right? So, you know, this just kind of goes through and asks if they're affiliated with any of the major organizations. I'll leave this up front for you to look at, like all the ecumenical groups. And, you know, do you believe in eternal security? Are you premillennial? Are you pre-tribulation rapture? Are you, you know, uh, uh, evangelistic? Do you believe in theistic evolution? Just lots of good things. So I'll leave that up there for you to look. But there's a verse that Paul says in Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 5. And when those individuals had come down from Jerusalem, they had brought with them bad doctrine. And when they had brought that bad doctrine down and in, it was troubling, it was making people fearful, it was worrying them, and really it was the law that they were preaching and teaching to them. They were teaching salvation by the law, they were teaching justification by the law. And in verse number 5, or 4, let's read, he says, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in. So we had these guys, we didn't know that they were false brethren, I mean there's a lot of people out there. What does he say? Who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So what they wanted to teach was bad doctrine that would bring you into bondage. And so what Paul taught was not bondage. He taught liberty. He taught freedom. He taught peace. He taught eternal life. In verse number 5, he makes it very clear. He says, those individuals who are the false brethren, he says, to whom we gave place by subjection, we didn't allow them to come in. No, not for an hour. And there's the reason behind it is that if we were to allow these individuals to come in to preach, even if it was only for an hour, and I think that's kind of interesting. I say, well, no, not for an hour. Like, well, maybe it's, that, that's like a short time frame. He doesn't say, no, not for a minute, does he? He says, no, not for an hour. And so you wonder if you're thinking, man, they may be sitting there for four, five, six. I mean, you remember the story of Eutychus? Paul's long preaching into the night. And, you know, sometimes we go hour 15, hour 20, and I can tell what happens, you know. I see everybody bu busting out the peps at AC and the Tums, and they're just chewing them. Come on, Russ. Come on, Jason. Get done. You know, and I know how that can be. You know, you're hungry. You're dying. You're like, oh, I just want to get out of here. I can only take an hour. You know, so you wonder how long it would be for, for this when he says, no, not for an hour. So really he's saying, I didn't let these guys come in, no, not for an hour. And the reason being was this, because people's minds are very susceptible, especially if you're not well-established. If you're well established, your mind, I, I mean, I, I feel like myself, I, I've, over the last four or five years, have established myself to the point where I can hear just about anything and I can be very discerning, come back to the scripture and, and find the truth. He says here that if they were to allow these individuals to come in for an hour, he says that the truth of the gospel, what would it might have happened, it might not have continued with you. You may have been confused as to what the gospel was and you may then have gone out and done what? Now, I want to make it very clear that just because he does it here in Galatia and he prevented it from happening there, don't think that they didn't infiltrate and go to other churches, you know. They, they did. They made their way out and they created a huge problem. If you read there in the book of 1 Thessalonians, that they forbade the individuals, the, 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 the Jews, to speak to the Gentiles, right, that they might be saved. And so that was part of their issue. And, and then if they did talk to him, what would they teach him? Oh, you've got to do X, Y, and Z. You've got to go get circumcised, as we've gone through and studied that out at length. <clears throat> Part of the reason I bring that up is because of what's going to be taking place in these next couple chapters in, in, in Acts chapter number 10. Where we are at in the time frame and in the time period here, if you go back to Acts chapter 10, please, I know we finished up chapter 9. That is the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. We're going we're gonna to see a, a kind of a shift back to Peter for a little bit here. And Peter's going to be the, the central focus along with a Gentile man. So what you're going to see is you're going to see really the first Gentile. And I put Gentile in quotes because while he is a Gentile, and we're going to see that, he is also what I've determined he is a proselyte. He's also a man who is devout. He's uh, one who keeps the law, and I'll show you how we've come to those conclusions. So if you look at uh, Acts chapter number 10, this passage provides such a significant clearing regarding, really, I think, three things. So the first thing that it clears up is that it tells you Christ's earthly ministry, what it was about, and to whom it was directed towards. You're going to see that in Acts 10. You're going to, you're, even though we've already seen that in Matthew, all right, in Mark and Luke and John, we've seen those passages, we're going to see it again discussed here in Acts chapter number 10 as kind of a clarity issue. Because whenever we're starting to deal with the Gentiles, we have to make that clarity and that distinction. And then you're going to see the next. You're going to see Peter 
and the twelve's ministry up until this point in Acts chapter number 10 into whom that was directed towards. So I want to make it very clear that there is a distinction between Jew and Gentile, and it is greatly emphasized here in Acts chapter number 10. I mean, incredibly emphasized. And then you're going to see a conclusion made by Peter, which he really should have maybe even started to come to this conclusion before, based upon things like the Great Commission, things like Acts chapter number 1 and, and that same commission that is given there, right? Uh, other verses that could maybe understand through prophecy his understanding about Gentile salvation through Israel, not in spite Israel, okay? And we're going to see the clearing up of this issue. <clears throat> so if you look at Acts chapter number 10, just a, a quick other recap of where we are. Remember that at this point in time, Saul of Tarsus has been saved. Yes, he was on the road to Damascus. He has believed, and he is now a disciple of Christ. He is, we, we went through and showed you what his kind of uh, time frame was of where he was at. Remember where he went. He went to Arabia, then Damascus again, then three years later he went to Jerusalem. So some of these issues could be taking place at a very similar period of time. It's, it's not you know, incredibly detailed as to when, like, okay, I could say with absolute certainty that it's right here, right then, right now, right? So was it, was it right at Acts 9? Was this, was this a year later? Was this two years later? I have some thoughts and we'll go through that, but just think about it as we go through. So Acts chapter number 10, verse number 1, let's read. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. What are centurions? What are they? They're soldiers, right? So a soldier of the Italian band, he's an individual who is keeping what? He's keeping the peace? Is he not? Is he, is he not uh, uh, enforcing the law? Right? Yes? And you understand that for the most part, Rome is ruling, right? We understand that Rome is, is, the, is the ruling government at that point in time. But Cornelius, being of Caesarea, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band, he is an individual who is not a Jew, okay? And so we know this from two verses. So let's look first at verse number 28 of Acts 10. Go to Acts chapter number 10, verse 28. Start at verse 27, and he says, and as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So is there a distinction between a Jew, right, and a Gentile? Yes. Most definitely, absolutely. Even up until this point, is there a distinction? Yes. In Acts chapter number 3, he says, Unto you first, God having sent his Son. Right? And that's what we've been doing. We've been dealing with who first? The Jews first. So make that very clear when you study the book of Acts that there have not been any Gentiles in this program. There haven't been just like, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of all these, all these guys are really Gentiles. No. We discussed those in Samaria. And I'm going to compare today a little bit the Ethiopian eunuch from Acts chapter number 8. We remember him. We're going to compare him with, with this uh, Cornelius as well in their devotion, in their per, perhaps the proselyte, proselyte, as you might say. So in verse number 45 is another verse, right? Go back over to 45. So we're just showing you that, that Cornelius here is not a, a Jew, right? He's not a Jew from birth, right? He doesn't have the lineage aspect that he was born that way, okay? So look at verse number 45. And they of the circumcision, remember that's what that big distinction and delineation was between a Jew, right? They call themselves the circumcision made with what? Made with hands. And what do they call the uncircumcision? You're the uncircumcision. Ephesians chapter number 2, right? Verses 11 and 12. So go down, you read, he says, they were astonished as many as came with Peter, because who was with Peter? Was it a bunch of Gentiles that were with Peter? No. We understand that who came with Peter? Other Jews, other circumcision. The circumcision came with him. Okay? We're not here, let's make sure really clear, we're not talking about circumcision not made with hands, circumcision made with hands. We're talking about actual physical circumcision, right? We're not talking about the spiritual aspect of it at this point in time, all right? He says, because that, and they were astonished, because that on the Gentiles, and so those are the people that were with the centurion, those are those of his household, those were the soldiers that were with him, was also, also was poured out of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. So as was on them in Acts chapter number 2, it came upon them in Acts chapter number 10. 
Okay, we kind of see where we're at on that. That's how I'm making the distinction that we know that he's not a not, he's not a Jew by lineage. He's not a Jew by birth. But I'm going to show you in verse number two, you'll see that he's a devout man. And when, you have, when you're devout, what does that mean? You have devotion. And when you have devotion, what do you have, devotion, what do you have, to, have to have devotion? You have to have a, an object to place your devotion towards. So what is that object? See, Cornelius is a centurion, and, and we have several references to centurions, and I, I like to go back to some of those because it's interesting to see that many of the references in regards to centurions is in a positive manner is in a positive light. If you go back to Matthew chapter number uh, 8, just throw a pen in Acts 10. In Matthew chapter number 8, I really think this is a great passage because it shows you, again, what number one God is looking for, has been looking for, and will always be looking for, and that is what? Faith. So if you look at uh, Matthew chapter number 8, and you look in verse number 5, read what it says. <clears throat> and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord. So he recognizes that Jesus Christ is a Lord. He says, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Wow, is that not a demonstration of a lot of faith? Yeah, you don't even need to come. I know who you are. I know what you can do. I've heard about you. So just speak the word, and it's going to happen. He goes, verse number 9, he makes the comparison. He gives you the symbolism. He says, look, I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth. And to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. You're going to see this take place in Acts chapter number 10. When he tells his servants to go do things, he tells the, centurion, the other soldiers to go do things, they go and they do it. They don't question him. They don't say, we don't really want to go see Peter. They're obedient because he has the authority. So therefore, he's making the connection that, Jesus, you have authority. And you have authority to take care of ailments and take care of pain and to perform miracles and, and heal. And so in verse number 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed. Now think of this. Remember, who's mostly following him are going to be what? They're going to be the Jews. Remember, he's going to the cities that he has been sent and he's not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he went to a lot of cities that he sent. He mentions that in the book of Mark early on. He says, I've got to go to some other cities that I'm sent, and I'm not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we'll see that be discussed here in Acts chapter number 10 as well. So when he says this, this is kind of a, kind of a rebuke to the nation and to the people who are following. Look what he says. He says, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Wow. So what's he looking for? He's looking for those to believe who he is. That's the central, most important part of Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. It's for you to believe who I am. For if you do not believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. That's it. So what we're going to see here is we're going to see some devotion by this centurion in Acts chapter number 10 that he needs some help. Because what's happening with him is he's, he's kind of, you know, he understands, I'm going to show you, I think he understands who, who Jesus was. But he's, he's underneath the law, and he's going to be kind of the same way as is the uh, Ethiopian eunuch in that he's giving his alms. Well, what is that all about? I'm going to show you that, pieces of the law. Go over to... Uh, uh, Luke 7, it's, a, it's the same reference. You can just look. Just You can read that later. He says the same thing, but verse number 9. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. I mean, isn't that what he's really came and he's looking for? I'm looking for faith. I'm looking for you to believe. Verse 10, it shows that, that, that the faith 
was there and that he was that the man was healed. Verse 10, and they that were sent returning to the house found the servant whole that had been sick. See, there was another centurion too who was there at the death and crucifixion of Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember that story as well? Remember in Matthew chapter number 27? Uh, go over there, Matthew 27. Actually, I like the one in Luke better. Go to Luke uh, 23. It's a little bit better of a, a, a record. <clears throat> Luke 23. And read in verse number... If you can read in verse number 44... And we're going to talk about these hours. I know a lot of people get confused. They go, oh, what is the sixth hour, right? Well, how, how do we have the ninth hour? What does that mean? You know, is it military time? Do we go from 12 and the sixth hour to be 6 a.m. and the ninth time? No, we'll see how that works here in just a minute because it's going to be important in their visions and trances, the vision that Cornelius has and the trance that Peter is in, what time they take place. Verse number 44, and it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, okay? And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that site, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Go to Matthew 27, verse 54, too. I want to show you what his statement was. He says he surely was a righteous man. In Matthew 27, verse 54, you see a little bit more detail as to what he's really thinking, what, what, what's in his mind, what he really understands. And there he says, uh, the, verse number 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, Matthew 27, 51. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went to the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion... And they that were with him, watching Jesus, saw the earthquake and those things that were done. What did they do? They feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. Is, not that, is that not the, the phrase that, that Christ was looking for? Do you believe that I am He? Right? Do you believe that I am the Son of God? In Acts chapter 10, verse 2, you see a man who is a devout man. The centurion is devout. Acts 10, verse 2, please. He is one who fears God. And he fears God with all of his house. And as you can see, he is one which gave much alms to the people. And we're going to look about who that is. What are the people? And that he prayed to God always. In Proverbs chapter number 9, verse 10, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. See, the fear of the God, fear of God is a very good thing, is it not? Do we not live in a society today in which people, for the most part, flat out do not fear God? Romans chapter 3, verse 18. What does it say? Go to Romans 3, verse 18. He says, this is, of course, talking about the world being without, with, uh, with sin, all under sin. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good. And then he says there in verse number 18, There is no fear of God before their eyes. Us today, do we fear God? We have peace with God, do we not? Romans chapter number 5, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that we could have peace with God is through Christ and what he has done. The fear of God before their eyes is something that most people will live. They, they don't care. They're not interested in, 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 in future in terms of their death. They're not interested in what takes place after that. But this man here, Cornelius, he did. And he feared God. He knew what God can do. He's understood about Jehovah God and how he can do anything he wants to do. He taught his house and he taught his, the other centurions and soldiers that were with him. But what's this question about these, these alms, right? What is this that he gave alms? 
Well, what are alms? I remember growing up, and I don't remember why I remembered this, but you have like the five things of Islam. Does anybody remember doing this? Like you had to memorize these things? I, I don't know why I memorized these things. It was, maybe it was in a world religions class in college. I, I don't remember. But you have to remember like the five things of Islam. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. You know what I mean? All, do you, does anybody, anybody took a world religions class ever? Do you remember having to do that for, for Islam? I remember writing it down. I remember being like, I really hate to have to write this all down. But, you know, again, it's part of the secular, you know, culture and, and secular education that you grew up in. But one of the other ones is, is give alms to the poor, right? That's, that's one of the things that they say, give alms to the poor. So when you give alms, this is something like you, you give out, out of what you have, right? If you look over in Acts chapter number 9, verse number 36, it says that Tabitha Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And then we, we showed you back again to the, the uh, lame man there in chapter 3 of Acts. And he was, remember what he says? He was the one who went into the temple. Look at Acts 3.3. 3. They saw Peter and John. They went into the temple. And while they were in there, they asked alms of him, right? And Peter, fasting his eyes upon him, said, look on us. And he, they thought he was going to give him something, but he didn't have anything to give. So the alms issue there is what? Well, this goes back to an issue of law keeping. And I want to show you how this works. So in Acts chapter number 10, if the centurion is a devout man, he has devotion towards what? What do you think his devotion is? Well, of course it's to God, but it's the God that's been revealed to him by who and through who? Well, through what the Jews have taught him. I want to show you this and go back to Deuteronomy chapter number 15, verse number 7. In Deuteronomy chapter number 15, verse number 7, this was an obligation to the nation of Israel to take care of the poor in their, uh, amongst them. And so Jesus Christ says that the poor will always be with you. In Galatians, they said even between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, he says that we be mindful to the poor. He says, yeah, which we always, you know, which we were mindful to do already. But yeah. And in, and in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7, he says this, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of the gates of thy land, and you can go back to Acts 3 and you can see that. He says, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. I mean, how many times do you go by somebody who is poor on the street, and you're like, I give it him a dollar. And you know what my dad used to always say? Spear money, spear money, don't give it to him, right? Isn't that, isn't that, it's pretty much true. Or it's, it smokes money, it smokes money, don't give him a dollar, he's just going to do it. Because I remember growing up and I'd be like walking around, and I'd give him a dollar. My dad's like, don't do that, he's going to use it for smokes. And uh, one of the other guys that I used to go with, he, uh, we, we, we did some mission work together, and he, said, he had a really good uh, uh, way of doing it. We would go somewhere, and let's say we're walking downtown or something, and he would see a guy sitting in the corner, and he's got a thing, you know, homeless, hungry, need, need food, or, you know, please, God bless any money you give me. So he'd walk up to him and say, you hungry? He goes, yeah. He goes, okay, we're going to lunch. Come with me. And he'd take him into lunch, and he'd go in, and he'd say, uh, tell, tell the waiter, you know, whatever he wants, it's on me. Just give me the tab. He can order as much food as he wants, and he can have food to go, too. So just get him whatever he needs. And that way, the guy would actually get the food he needed, and then he would also give him, you know, some type of literature and say, you know, here, and, you know, administer to him. What I thought was interesting is not always would the person sit with us. Sometimes he'd be like, you sit over there in the corner. I'm like, ah, I mean, you know, if you're going to go, you might as well bring him all the way and sit down and have a meal with him, not just put him in the corner over there. You know, he's smelly and dirty and whatever. I, I think the guy's heart was right in what he did. But, uh, you know, this is something that they had an obligation to do. If there was somebody in their, in their congregation or in their, among the brethren, he says, you don't, you don't want to harden your heart. Don't go, don't be like, oh, you're clenched that money in your pocket. Be like, I don't want to give it to him. So he says in verse number 8, But thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. He says, Beware that there be not a thought in thine wicked heart, saying, The seventh year, the year of release, is at hand, and then I be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not, and he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. So what that's talking about, if you go to verse number one, there's seven years of release. If you, if you gave somebody some money, they, they would come up, and you wouldn't have to pay it anymore. The debt obligation would cease and that kind of stuff. So you're like, well, we need to wait till the seven years is over. Then I get a whole other seven years, and then I can collect my interest and all the other stuff. Verse number 10, he says, Thou shalt surely give him. And that heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, in, in all that thou puttest thine hand unto. For the poor shall never cease out of the land. I like that verse, because is that what not Christ said himself? The poor shall always be with you? Yeah, and there it is. Another example of Jesus Christ being the word and preaching the word. 
even the Old Testament. He says, Therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. And so, pretty interesting. I, I like that, that passage. And you can see that this devotion that he had was a devotion toward God. He had a devotion towards God because I believe that he was instructed and he was uh, one who had a good report, as we'll see, among those Jews. So, what does this mean? So, for my reading of Acts chapter number 10 and what I've concluded so far, I believe that Cornelius was practicing Judaism. And here's, here's why I, I say that. In verse number 2, he's called that devout man. And if you look similarly in Acts chapter number 2, verse 5, I want to show you this for a second. Acts 2, verse 5, you see typically who are called devout men would be those who are Jews, those who are practicing the Jews' religion. So if you look in verse 5, and he says, and there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, and look at the word, devout men. So you can be a Jew, or you can be a devout Jew, right? I mean, I have a lot of friends who are Jews, but they're not really devout. They don't know anything about it. They're Jewish more in, in lineage than they are Jewish in actual practice of the religion. Well, this issue of de devotion is being devote, devote, t devoting to God and devoting to the law and really obedience to the Jews' religion. Remember what Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verse uh, 23. We don't have to go there. He says, I behold your devotion, right? He saw all their statutes and their idols and their things. He says, I saw your devotion. That's kind of, you know, your uh, uh, dedication and your working toward trying to please this God. But I want to really demonstrate that, that I think he is uh, a proselyte in this way. Cornelius was. Look at this with me again. Go to Acts 2, verse 10, and that tells you about these proselytes. This is the term that we've used before. A proselyte would be what? What is that? Somebody who is not a Jew by birth, but has done what? Has converted to the Jews' religion, meaning that they're practicing it and they're doing it. And so what I want to make very clear is that the Jews would do this mostly for the purpose of lining their pockets. Okay? That was really the main purpose as to why they would create proselytes. They weren't creating proselytes because they cared about the souls of men. They didn't create proselytes because they wanted to, to uh, create a strong worship of, of God you know, with more people. No, that really wasn't the issue. The issue was the lining of the pockets. And I'm going to show you that through a lot of uh, the, the scriptures that we're going to co co cover and go over. So in 2 verse 10, you'll see that he talks about um, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews, and then what's the other word he says? And proselytes. So there are Jews, you know, scattered throughout, of course, but there's also the Jews and then there's the proselytes. So this proselytizing that they do is a conversion and saying, come, come to the Jews' religion, right? So look at Matthew 23 in verse number 15, and we'll compare this with this Ethiopian eunuch here in a second. Matthew 23, verse number 15. <clears throat> the leaders of the Jews' religion were who? Who were they? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the elders, the council, right? Those are all words that you could use to describe the, the, the higher-ups. In verse number 14, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Verse 15, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, that is when you've converted him to the Jews' religion, when you've told him what he should do in terms of what you want it to be, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. I mean, that's a pretty flaming indictment against them about how they operate and what they're doing. So the Jews, when they're creating these proselytes, they're not creating good proselytes. They're creating bad proselytes. And mostly the reason why is because they're just putting the law on top of them. They're not teaching them anything about faith. And what ultimately they're really doing is they're profiting off of them. Remember when Paul says that he profited in the Jews' religion above many mine own equals, right? The profiting is lining the pockets. Go to Acts chapter number 8, and you'll see, why do you think 
that the Jews would deal with an Ethiopian? Why do you think they would deal with Candace the Queen and all that stuff? I know certainly well why, because she has what? She's got lots of money. And because she has lots of money, this Ethiopian eunuch, if you read here in verse number 27, he says, And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians, who had what? Charge of all her treasure. So what are they looking for? They're looking for that money. And so same thing goes with this centurion. They're going to do the same things. They're going to try to get him to do what? Oh, give us the money. Give us the alms deeds. And as you read there in Acts chapter number 10, he did. He gave much alms to the people. He gave a lot. And those people liked it. Yeah, keep giving me more of those alms. Keep giving me more of those alms. Bring back some more to here, and, and you'll be good. Now, how do we know that the Jews got this and accepted it? How do we know that that's what was really going on? Well, if you go over here and read in Acts chapter number 10, verse 22, read what it says. Acts 10, verse 22. And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man. That's something I want to spend some time talking about. I do think he was a just man. He says, and one that feareth God and of, now look at this word, good rapport among all the nation of the Jews. How does a Gentile get good rapport of all the nation of the Jews? How does that occur? Who else that we just recently saw had a good rapport? Ananias. Did he not? Didn't Ananias in Acts chapter, go to Acts chapter 22. Ananias had a good rapport as well. And you'll see the same words used, and you'll see a, a better explanation of it. Now you'll see it like this. Look what it says. Verse 12 of chapter 22. And one Ananias, a devout man. Now look at what he's a devout according to. According to the law. Okay, so if you're devout according to the law, what is that going to give you? Well, look what he says. Having a good rapport of all the Jews which dwelt there. So what happens? When you have a good rapport, you're doing what? You're devout according to the law. And when you're devout according to the law, you have a good rapport. So we're going to see and go back to Cornelius. What's he doing? Well, obviously he's doing what? He has a good rapport, and he's, he's doing the law, and he's giving them the, whatever money they want, and he sends them those alms, and he does all that stuff, and he thinks that's what he should be doing. These Jews, unfortunately, they make those bad proselytes. But if you look here, and, and again in 10 verse 22, some people will say he gave much alms to the people and say, well, that's talking about the remnant. Well, no, it's not talking about the remnant. Because if you read over here in verse number 22, he's getting a rapport of the nation of the Jews. The nation as a whole is what? They're, they're apostate at this point in time. Okay? I want to talk about the just man here in just a, a little bit, but when you go through here and you see that you know, Ananias and Cornelius, the similarities in their devotion, the similarities in their rapport of the Jews, it's kind of showing you that, that they're one and the same, meaning that, they, that while Ananias is a Jew, and we understand that, uh, Cornelius is a proselyte, they're doing things that are innately Jewish. That is, whatever the Jews tell them to do, we're going to do it. That is, follow the law, have devotion towards the law. Uh, if, we, if we go back through, go down to uh, verse number 3, in this particular issue, we go, devout man, he's fearing God with all his house, gives much alms to people, prayed to God all way, and then he sees in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, what? an angel of God coming into him and saying him unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto them, Now look at this, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Really cool verse. We're going to go over there in just a second. But this ninth hour of the day, this, this Gentile centurion, this proselyte, he had a vision a supernatural event in which God reveals something about himself to the person receiving that vision. Now, what is the ninth hour of the day? We just read the sixth hour of the day in, in uh, Matthew 27, and then we're talking about the ninth hour of the day. What is that? How does that work? 
Well, I, I like to just not tell you. I like to go to the verse and then say, this is how I come to this definition. I think that's usually the best. So if you look at John 11, verse 9, this is how I'm getting the definition for hours of the day, times, that kind of stuff. In John 11, verse number 9, how many hours are in our day? 24, right? Well, how many hours are really in the day? 12, roughly, right? Look what he says here in John 11, verse number uh, 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? People say, oh, yeah, see, the Bible is wrong because there's, there's 24 hours in the day. Well, hold on a second. Are we talking about the day or are we talking about the night? It's really there's about 12 hours in, in the day. So he says, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. So what we're, we're determining is that there's 12 hours of daylight. So it starts at the first hour being roughly 6 or 7 o'clock, right, in the morning. That's how we're coming to this understanding. So the hours of the day are talking about hours of daylight. The ninth hour would be roughly about 2 or 3 in the afternoon. So if you go back to Acts chapter number 10, he sees this vis visit, and this visitation is from the angel of the Lord. And, and, of course, we've seen the angel of God, and we've seen the angel of the Lord being used a lot in these last couple passages, the past couple chapters. And it was w one of the many ways that God used uh, uh, to communicate to people. In Acts chapter number 10, verse number 4, it's interesting. Look what he says. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. I think this verse gives us a glimpse and a look into the understanding that God has about what goes on in the day-to-day -day affairs, the day-to-day -day life. And a lot of people say, oh, he's far removed. He doesn't know what's going on. Um, no, he knows everything that's going on. It's so hard for our minds to process that, is it not? It's hard for us to comprehend that God could, could be, you know, uh, uh, at, at every second of the day understanding what everything is actually taking place and transpiring, you know? There's a phrase, and I wish I could remember what it is. Uh, I didn't know that it actually was like a term. It's some term. I can't remember what it is. Basically, it's a point in time in your life in which while you're kind of just going through life, you realize that the complexities of your life, right, meaning the people you know, your job, what you do, how things are just so complex, he says, they're multiplied out among all these other people, and all of a sudden you have this realization of almost just overwhelming, just there's, there's so much going on. And I remember one time I was driving in the car, and I, I, I thought about, I saw the people, and I was going through, and I go, man, that, it's really it's really weird. There's just so many people. I said, this person's doing the same thing. Like, I'm going to dinner right now. This guy's coming back from work. This guy's going here. And it just got, I actually got a little bit overwhelmed when I was driving. I was like, man, that's pretty crazy. Just all the things. And I went home and Googled it. Of course, that's what you, you know, it's kind of like when you have a medical problem. Should you ever Google your medical problems? You know, no. What ends up happening? You think you have every problem under the sun. You got brain cancer. You know, WebMD. It's cancer. It's lupus. Whatever it might be. So you, you go through, and I kind of Googled it, and I found the word. I'm going to try to find it for you guys. But it was really interesting. I, I, it's, like a, a, it's a philosophical thing more than anything, but it's interesting to kind of see. But it's, it's hard for our minds to wrap it around just how, 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 how much God is. You know, we use the word omniscient, right? Meaning he, he understands everything. He has knowledge about everything, and he does. This, kind of, this verse gives us an interesting idea about really the, not just God knowing and understanding, but God's recording the recordation of what happens in life. That is, God is not oblivious to what occurs and what happens, but he really understands and he knows and he remembers everything that occurs at every second of the day. You know, really what one of those verses is, is Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12. And in that passage of Scripture, we'll just look there just for a second, you'll see that recordation. That recordation is there, and he says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. So what are these books? It's, it's a recording. It's, it's the way God keeps track and keeps tabs. I mean, does he need books? No. Who needs books? The angels and everybody else? He's like, here you go. You guys have these books. They're there. And he says, the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life, book of life, what takes place, what transpires in the life of a man. He says, which were dead, were judged out of those things according to what? Which were written in the books according to their work. So he, he keeps track. He understands what's going on, you know. No fool in God. No hiding from him. It's not, 
It's not possible to do so. You know, well, we really thank God that, you know, he doesn't remember our sin, that he actually chooses to forget that sin. You can look at passages like Hebrews 8, uh, Isaiah 43, there's other ones as well. But he, he doesn't just forget them and say, okay, they're all right. It's the only reason why he forgets them and wishes to remember them no more and does so is because of what Christ did for us. And because he died on the cross for us in our place, that is how we now can say, well, great. We know that the debt's been paid and God's been satisfied because he did it all for us. And we thank him for that. Well, we'll stop. I know it's 1030. Uh, we're going to get back up here and we're going to talk about this guy, Simon the Tanner. No, he wasn't sitting on his rooftop, you know, getting tanned. I thought that was good. But uh, yeah, what, what a tanner really is, what he does, he doesn't have, he, Simon the Tanner, he doesn't have the tanning bed booth, you know. He's the only one in Joppa with the tanning bed. No, it's nothing like that. And we'll go through some of those issues too. So we'll pick up there uh, next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the time, the opportunity to study the word. <clears throat> Appreciate everybody that shows up, Lord. As we continue to study through the book of Acts, Lord, we uh, just thank you for the, the record. Uh, thank you that we can read it and study it and understand it. And that we'll come away with uh, more knowledge, Lord, so that ultimately what we can do is take that knowledge, apply it, and then teach others also. In your son's name we pray. Amen.